This episode of The History Guy brought to you by Magellan TV and their new documentary series, Alive, Surviving Catastrophe. In early May 1902, a man named Louis Auguste Sipari turned himself in to authorities in St. Pierre. He might well have been a pirate, because according to historian and volcanologist Alwyn Scarth, he was turning himself in because he had previously escaped in order to attend a celebration after having been arrested for stabbing a friend with a cutlass. He was thrown into a cell that had been originally built as a bomb-proof powder magazine, a small cell that had no windows, whose only ventilation was a small grate in the door. And because of that sorry situation, he was one of the luckiest men in history. Because of that cell, he would be one of only a very small handful of people to survive the deadliest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Surviving disaster is a dramatic event. And that is the subject of the new Magellan TV documentary, Alive! Surviving Catastrophe, which tells the story from the perspective of several separate survivors of disasters that grabbed global headlines. The stories are deeply personal and emotional accounts of an adventure, sometimes only a few hours in length, that changed their lives in the aftermath. Great documentaries like Alive! Surviving Catastrophe are one of the reasons that I continue subscribing to Magellan TV, because despite having thousands of documentaries already, they add new documentaries every week. To show their appreciation for History Guy viewers, Magellan TV is offering the first episode of Alive! Surviving Catastrophe, San Francisco Freeway Collapse, for free view for the next seven days. That means that if you don't currently have a Magellan TV membership, you can still stream Alive! Surviving Catastrophe, San Francisco Freeway Collapse, from today, September 2nd through September 8th, for free. Magellan TV is a streaming documentary service that is run by documentary filmmakers, and golly, you really should subscribe. And in order to do that, they've offered a special offer just for History Guy viewers of a one-month free trial if you sign up using the link in the description. And when you do, be sure and check out Alive! Surviving Catastrophe. Martinique is an island in the Windward Islands of the Lesser Antilles in the Caribbean Sea. The first European settlement was Fort St. Pierre, established in 1635. Officially, Fort de France was the administrative capital of the island, however, the older and more vibrant St. Pierre remained the cultural and commercial center and one of the most important cities in the Caribbean. In 1902, it had a population of around 26,000. It was wealthy thanks to agriculture and the production and shipment of rum. Above the bustling town was the volcano Mount Pelee, named after the Hawaiian goddess of volcanoes. It had erupted twice since Europeans arrived in 1792 and 1851, but the eruptions launched only ash. It was known among the indigenous Caribs as Fire Mountain, evidence that it had erupted earlier in history. Volcanoes had been studied, but the best studied at the time seemed to erupt in a relatively controlled manner with slow-moving streams of lava. Pelé would show the world a new kind of eruption with devastating results. 1902 was an important election year for Martinique politics on the island were controlled mostly by the white colonial oligarchy, but cracks were finally beginning to appear in that strength, as the Martinique middle class, largely people of color and mixed race, turned against the white establishment. In 1899, Martinique had elected Amade Knight, the first black man elected on the island as senator. The 1902 elections were for the French Chamber of Deputies. Martinique elected two deputies, one for the northern part of the island and another for the southern. Knight's radical party was trying to win control of all of the island's Parisian posts. The contest was between Ferdinand Clerc for the establishment and Louis Persen for the radicals. The first vote was on May 4th, but was indecisive. A runoff was scheduled for May 11th. Both sides considered the election enormously important for the future of the island. Early in 1902, Palais had begun to awaken with fumaroles, vents that release volcanic gases, appearing at the summit. Such vents had appeared and gone in the past. On April 23rd, the volcano began spewing steam in a series of explosive eruptions caused by groundwater being heated by magma. Ash began to fall in the first few days of May. Lightning filled the eruption clouds, dumping ash on St. Pierre and other villages so heavily that it blocked out the sun. On May 2nd, a mudslide killed a plantation owner and several of his workers. Around mid-morning, the captain of the Topaz noticed new land created by fresh lava. He also noticed dead fish. Though he didn't know it, the fish had been killed by a shockwave below the water from quakes caused by Pelé. 
Those same quakes would soon destroy the telegraph links between the entire island of Martinique and the outside world. Locals largely didn't take the danger seriously. Our children pretended snow was falling. Round one, Iceland, Iceland, the little one screamed. But though the white powder was harmless enough, it became too thick for comfort. A tourist wrote that the ash gave to the town the appearance of a European village covered from the first frost of autumn. In St. Pierre, Le Colonies, the local paper, assured everyone that a leading authority had determined that the ash was temporary and that the volcano would soon become dormant again. It was all lies. The authority was made up by Andreas Hurard, the editor, at the request of the governor. Hurard brushed aside Clerk when he pressed for the paper to advocate for evacuation and ridiculed those that were already fleeing. We confess that we cannot understand this panic. Where better could one be than in St. Pierre? The governor, Louis Moutet, wanted to prevent a panic, mostly because the election was still planned to go on. The people most likely to flee were his voters, the wealthier class who could afford to escape while the poor would remain. The volcano continued to rumble, its peak glowing from the building magma. Cleric's wife, Veronique, wrote to family that if there is time, I will write and give you my last thoughts if I must die. But it is possible that death will be swift and unexpected. The American consul, Thomas Prentice, attempted to send a telegraph to Washington, but Moutet blocked it from being sent. Moutet sent the consul a note, chiding him for spreading alarm abroad and creating a state of false fear. Rivers overflowed their banks, sweeping people out to sea. Clerk pressed the town leaders to evacuate, but the leaders refused. The town was protected from lava by three valleys, one argued. Food and water supplies were low, however, and animals died in the ash. Soon people were choking to death on the ash as well. Moutet appointed a commission to examine the volcano, which included Gaston Landes, a natural science professor who was the island's leading scientist. The commission's report and a fake interview with Landes was published in Les Colonies the day before the eruption. Without examining the volcano itself, the commission assured everyone scientifically that there was no danger from ash and lava. There is nothing in the activity of Palais that warrants a departure from St. Pierre, it proclaimed. The safety of St. Pierre was absolutely assured. By May 4th, more than 200 people had been killed by the eruption. Ominous signs, however, continued. Centipedes and insects poured down the mountain in an invasion as they fled from the heights. Deadly vipers followed, killing dozens. On May 5th, a mass of boiling water and mud 100 feet tall buried a sugar works, killing another 150 people. It was as if they had never been there, one witness described as he watched the factory simply disappear. The mudslide continued to the shore, filling the water and causing a 50-foot tidal wave which crashed into the town and left St. Pierre looking like a place which had been visited by the scouts of the enemy's army. 28 children drowned in an orphanage, along with dozens of others. The garrison commander telegraphed continued updates. Panic appalling, he reported. Even as the city wallowed in darkness and mud, men were putting up a proclamation from the mayor that declared, We have no immediate danger to fear. The lava will not reach as far as the town. The governor sent soldiers to block the roads and prevent refugees from leaving who might spread needless alarm. Harard continued to refuse to advocate for evacuation in the newspaper, as it would interfere with the election. On May 7th, mere hours from the cataclysmic eruption, Governor Moutet arrived in preparation for a ball that evening. Actually, seeing the city convinced him to cancel the ball and finally consider evacuation. He stayed the night at a hotel. Unfortunately, his action came too late. May 8th, 1902, was Ascension Day, or Holy Thursday, a Christian holiday celebrating the ascension of Jesus into heaven. At 5 a.m. that morning, the volcano began rumbling with a new vigor. Smoke poured on the city. A report from a Catholic priest is likely the only surviving record of those last hours in St. Pierre. By half past five, the sun had risen in its course perhaps 20 degrees above the horizon, when the roaring of the dark shadowed mountain grew and grew. In the streets, hundreds of agonized people had gathered to make their devotions in the cathedral. The priest, Father Roche, was leaving town to examine the caldera. Roger Arnaud, a member of the Royal Society of France, was returning to St. Pierre when he chose instead to wait on a nearby height in relative safety. Smoke began to curl round and round the summit of Palais. Enormous rocks, clearly distinguishable, were being projected from the crater to a considerable height, so high indeed as to take about a quarter of a minute in their flight. Shortly after six o'clock, several detonations could be plainly heard, even from where I sat. The heat was suffocating. I could only imagine how much worse it must be in the town. 
A sudden wind blew the air around the city clear. The glowing rock from the summit was in direct line with St. Pierre. At 8.02, St. Pierre said its last word over the wires. Alle, meaning go. In the jail cell, Louis Auguste Sipari huddled in the corner of his cell. He urinated on his shirt and used it to try to block the dust entering the cell from his lungs. Outside the city, one witness said that the sun vanished. It was replaced by a glowing red ball which grew out of the side of Palais with a noise that was truly terrifying. The sky overhead became invisible. This was the end of the world. A molten cloud of rock and volcanic ash called a pyroclastic flow began rolling down the mountain, directly towards the town. It came with a rending, roaring sound, a continuous roar, blending with staccato beats like the throbbing, pulsating roar of a Gatling gun. We were now in complete darkness, except for the fearsome glow from the cloud. Another witness described it as a column of fire, at least 1,300 feet in height, which fell upon the town. The whole town, said Father Roche, vanished under the great wall of fire. At sea, ships disappeared in the ensuing cloud. At 803, one began sending a message on repeat. St. Pierre destroyed by Palais eruption. Send all assistance. One witness at sea described watching another ship hit by the flow. The mast, smokestack, and rigging were swept clean off a ship near the port, just like a clay pipe stem struck with a big stick. A second fiery black cloud followed the first, crashing into St. Pierre. People burned and drowned on the floundering ships. Another witness on a stricken ship looked back at the city. I could discern people running, with flames clinging to them. As I watched, hundreds of people ran into the sea, their scorched flesh sizzling, as it entered the hot water. Another witness wrote, Palais had, in a moment, made St. Pierre look as if it had been in ruins for a thousand years. Sipari was alive. The prison block collapsed and he was badly burned. The prison walls had gone, so had all the buildings beyond it. Near the ruined cathedral, bodies lay thickly, he said. There was silence, more terrible than what had gone before. I smelled nothing but my own body burning. Elsewhere in the city, another man claimed to have come out of his cellar to find nothing but carnage. I was sick and crazed with the sight of it all, he later said. And yet, in the face of almost unprecedented disaster, men who had watched from mere miles away immediately ran to the town to help. Father Roche was one. Physicians tell us that when there are too many sound waves, too many light waves, our ears no longer hear, our eyes no longer see. Does something similar perhaps apply to the brain when too many and too brutal impressions strike it at once, he pondered later. I know now the meaning of terror. I know what horror really is. St. Pierre was, the priest said, like those imitation towns made out of paper mache and painted wood. Imagine that an elephant tramples all over one, and it is then set alight, and that is finally dredged with ash and filth. Many died, though the numbers aren't certain. Some had fled, others had gone to St. Pierre in hopes of safety. Around 30,000 people died, possibly more, including the governor, Louis Mottet, Gaston Lenz, the professor who had been certain that the town was safe, the American consul and his family, and Andreas Herard, the editor of the paper. Three hours passed before a ship limped to Fort de France. A cable was sent to Paris. A firestorm destroyed St. Pierre and ships in road about 8 a.m., presume entire population, annihilated. The town was completely destroyed. The volcano exploded again on May 20th, killing 2,000 people, many of whom had come as rescuers. In August, another pyroclastic flow killed 800. The eruption was unlike any others that have been studied, and such eruptions are now called Palean eruptions. Around 10 square miles was destroyed by the pyroclastic cloud, which St. Pierre had its center. Aid was sent from around the world, nearly a million in direct aid, along with ships carrying medical supplies and doctors. Teddy Roosevelt got Congress to send $200,000. He described it as one of the greatest calamities in history. Mount Pelee kept erupting until it finally went dormant again in October of 1905. Sipari was pulled from the wreckage several days after the initial eruption. There were a few other survivors on the periphery of the city. One 10-year-old girl managed to row into a cave. Sipari made a living of his survival. He traveled with the Barnum and Bailey Circus, or he was billed as the only survivor. He lived for many years after, passing away either in 1929 or 1955. Sources disagree. St. Pierre never fully recovered. Today, the population is some 7,000. The story of the 1902 eruption of Mount Pelé is you know, it's tragic indeed. But that's all the more reason 
that the story should be told, because the people of St. Pierre deserve to be remembered. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you have to do is subscribe.